Y'all remember that one time on Criminal Minds? Y'all remember that one time on Law & Order SVU? Oh, you don't? Okay, cool. Let's talk about it. I'm assuming since you clicked on this video, you know the show Law & Order SVU. When a mother takes her eyes off her younger son at a birthday party to entertain another child, let's just say tragedy strikes when the kid goes missing, a five-year-old boy named Henry. The detectives from the SVU unit alongside Ice Cube, who's very rarely in this episode, which is kind of disappointing to me, are now on a case for a missing child. And throughout the hysteria and drama, there's this one group, don't remember what they're called, but essentially they are their own vigilante justice group that look for missing children. The detectives are doing everything they can when they go and talk to the missing child's father, Dr. Morton, who is a psychiatrist and deals with child psychology mostly. He seems very cold, reserved, and detached from the whole situation right off the gate, even finding out that his son is missing. He's kind of taking it in stride a little bit too calmly. Which leads them to their first potential break. A lady claims that she saw a kid in hysterics in a car with a male figure and they headed down to the subway station and the whole time the kid was on the fritz. Other witnesses said they saw the behavior and that it seemed like the kid was in genuine danger. So they tracked down this guy and it turns out it was a false alarm. Now they took out the picture and the kid looks strikingly uncanny, similar to Henry. And this frustrates the dad and it goes to show that at this point in time with a touchy subject, trying to find a child missing or a child predator. They kind of are trying to blame whoever they can and the dad's pissed. He's like, this is my stepson, dude, I'm gonna sue y'all. Throughout the investigations and leads, they end up going to the neighbor's house. This young 13 year old charming boy named Jake O'Hara who thinks he might be able to help with this case. In fact, Jake says that he saw Henry get abducted. He said a dude came by in a car wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses and he watched Henry get taken by this person. And then they get a tip on another man named Billy Turner who is a former child predator. They now target him. That little group I was telling you about, that kind of vigilante group that specializes in protecting children's rights and you know try to advocate for them. The one detective in that group kind of gets involved and they find him at Billy Turner's house. Billy's not there. And then they hunt down Billy and they bring him down to interrogation. They corner him. They pretty much threaten him where it's one of those moral conundrums and one of many in this episode where this man is clearly a child predator. He went through whatever jail therapy, whatever, and they're adamant that it was him. They're like, if you did this before, you had to have done it again. And they really grill him, especially Stabler, who's kind of taken this case to heart. He's very traumatized by it, tries to think about what it would be like if this happened to one of his kids. And Stabler takes it the most personally, you know, really harassing this man almost matter-of-factly knowing that it was him because this man is a former child predator. And it's another moral conundrum too because even though yes, what this man did was despicable and I'm not vouching for it, don't try to twist my words, if he is innocent, they are now re-triggering his trauma because they're like, look at the picture. He's like, I don't want to look at it. And they're like, look at it. And it's like, if he's really going through therapy and trying to change his life, I understand the case at hand is very consequential, but I feel like they were pressing him a little bit too harsh based on the very little leads that they had. During the midst of all this, they end up finding Henry and he is dead. He is inside of an alleyway stuffed into a trash bin. And it is discovered that he has cat hair all over him and pebbles stuffed into his throat, which is very haunting and tragic. They have, the, they have his father, the psychiatrist, Dr. Morton, come back and identify him. And again, we get another interaction that his response is calculated and he is really, you can tell the deep surrounding sorrow in his soul, but he's very reserved and he gets a hint that the detectives and Stabler have a suspect in mind, but they're not gonna tell him. They're like, we trust you as a professional psychiatrist, you can hold your ground, but we do not trust your wife at all. Showing that the dichotomy in that relationship, obviously the grieving mother is a little bit more un rightfully so unnerved by the whole situation. Now with this young boy's body, they have the cat hair and the pebbles, and luckily the pebbles have fingerprints on it. A 13 year old Jake O'Hara who said he'd witnessed Henry get taken is called into a lineup and he's going through the line. Billy Turner's there and then a bunch of randoms. And then he ends up identifying Billy Turner out of the lineup. So it's kind of unfolding into showing that, okay, this child predator is at it again, but this time with murder. While all this is happening, a riot ensues outside of Turner's house. Again, that little vigilante group comes back. They do, they're doing whatever they can to protest and get this man behind bars. Captain Benson is there and she's pretty much like, this isn't a protest, it's a riot, you gotta stop. And they keep pushing it and pushing it. So they take the main mastermind of this group and pretty much take him down to the station. They're like, you can't keep intervening with this case. After thorough forensics, they find out that the fingerprints on the pebbles do not match to Billy Turner's, but the, in fact, they match 
to somebody else and they're not quite sure who this person is but Stabler and Benson have an idea. They bring Jake O'Hara back in and he's very compassionate and sad throughout this entire episode. He's been devastated and triggered and really scared for his neighbor Henry. He's, they were good friends. He pretty much looked at him like he was his younger brother. But the little thing that Stabler and Benson find is that the fingerprints on the pebbles were the matches of what were child's fingerprints and the pebbles came from Jake O'Hara's yard. So they start to put pressure on Jake and he starts to get scared and they're like hey man like we don't want to convict you but all signs are pointing to you and this is where he breaks and he's like well Billy Turner the guy pointed out in the lineup the detective told me to say it so it's one of those little things now where the police are intervening trying to get the right guy trying to plant seeds into someone's pocket based off their past and this is a moral conundrum again and they find out that it wasn't one of their detectives it was the lead vigilante of this child group he was the one that told jake to say billy turner was the bad guy but they already proved that it wasn't billy they now think that jake has something to do with it as they press jake more and more he breaks down in tears and you find out that months ago he was sent to this reform school with a bunch of behavioral kids and he was tortured bullied and even sexually assaulted and this draws a conclusion that his trauma from this camp kind of set off a trigger in him that made him react violently towards Henry. Jake goes on to claim that him and Henry were playing outside and Jake accidentally tripped over and killed a cat and when Henry went to go tell on him he panicked and shoved rocks down his throat to get him to stop talking and it killed him and this sends shock waves throughout the detectives and the father Dr. Morton who feels guilt because he ultimately growing up around Jake and his family suggested to Jake's mom that he should go to a behavioral camp institution and he was the one that recommended it so for it to fall back on him to be like all right this kid was emotionally damaged and brutalized at my behalf and this turned into him killing my son out of the trauma that was inflicted onto him it was like a double-edged sword he couldn't live with that guilt dr morton seems perplexed he's genuinely devastated he's between these emotions of calm and reserve but gutturally devastated he can't believe that his son is dead that the kid that he tried to help did this and it's looking like it's all a result on him he tried to help the kid and the kid got tormented so bad that it turned him more aggressive by nature even though jake claimed that he had killed henry by accident dr morton asks to talk to jake and they have a little conversation where he's like why did you do this to my son and jake bawling his eyes out heartbroken devastated shocked says he's so sorry he's like i did not mean to kill your son he's like it was an accident something's wrong with me i panicked and instead of doing the right thing i just snapped and the doctor says, well, what did he say to you? What's the last thing my son said to you? And with tears down his eye, Jake says he was crying for his mommy. And that just sent chills and heartache down Dr. Morton's spine. And this leads to an issue where the detectives decide to try Jake as a adult. You know, he's 13 years old. He committed murder. They're going to prosecute him to the fullest extent. And again, is having that confliction back and forth in his mind where he's like, we can't prosecute this young kid. Yes, he did kill my son. And yes, it was wrong, but he's so young and the and the trauma he's been through is a result in him doing this killing and i think the biggest thing is that he's scared and upset because again he was the one that sent jake to this behavioral institution for jake to come back worse off so the doctor is very conflicted and one of the police people stayed they're like he's caught between his anger and his guilt and he doesn't know what to do with it which is true because he's so angry that his son was killed he's so angry that that jake did it but he feels so guilty because Maybe if he hadn't sent Jake off, this wouldn't have happened. And this is where the episode kind of takes a turn. They go to this behavioral camp that Jake went to, and they talk to counselors, the president, students, and it turns out that Jake was purely gaslighting these detectives, and they pretty much got a consensus that he wasn't tortured, he wasn't bullied. All the bruises he had and all the cuts and scars were self-inflicted. He was, in fact, the bully. He was the one that was targeting these students and harassing them and was showing cold-hearted emotions. And all these kids were genuinely scared. They had different interactions with these kids all saying, no, we were scared of Jake. And that really sends these detectives into a frenzy. And the episode starts to build and they finally, and they finally take Jake to court, but they decide to do it for adolescents. That where if he's convicted, he'll go to jail and be out by the time he's 18. But this doesn't sit well in Stabler's stomach. He's like, no, we got to prosecute him as an adult. So they go and intervene into this court case. And they say with special circumstances, they have to reverse it. And the judge isn't agreeing to it until they reveal. They're like, Jake lied about being tortured and abused at this camp. This is showing signs of sociopathic tendencies and lies and deceit. And this is when you get the look on Dr. Morton's face that he's like, wow, this little kid 
just played me like a flu. I'm a psychiatrist and I let my emotions and anger disturb my expertise and it's very heartbreaking. And this is where we get the scene that Jake flips like a switch from going from crying, hysterical, Oscar nominated performance. He's smiling, he's smirking, and he you can see in his eyes he feels no guilt at all, which is a total flip and it's actually quite chilling. Dr. Morton is in a frenzy and he's escorted out of the court saying, I believed you, Jake. I trusted you. How could you do this to my son? And Jake's just smiling at him. As Morton's taken into the hallway, he's getting talked down by Stabler and he pretty, and he pretty much says, sociopaths aren't curable. They're going to kill again and again and something needs to stop. And as he says that, Jake is escorted out by his mother and Jake just looks at him and smiles and he goes, I'm sorry about killing your son. And in his eyes, you could see that it is in fact true that he is a sociopath and this is where the episode gets a little crazy dr morton snaps pushes stabler away grabs a pistol off a guard's hip and shoots jake jake ends up dying at the hospital and now dr morton is in custody you know the doctors the detectives stabler even said they're like we knew this guy was wound too tight he was so calm and emotionless during this investigation that he was bound to explode at any moment but ultimately they decide to prosecute the doctor and it is a it's a conundrum between manslaughter and murder two which his defense argues that he has no idea what had happened he just snapped and after dealing with what jake did to them to manipulate them the lawyers and police think that now Dr. Morton is doing the same thing that Jake did and pretty much gaslighting them into saying that he is innocent. And here's the thing, Morton knows what to say. He's a psychiatrist. They bring this up like he's a psychiatrist. He studies in psychology, emotions, all of this. He might be planting the seeds of acting emotionally damaged. But the doctor claimed that he had an extreme emotional disturbance and with that, he couldn't account for the actions he did. He knew he killed Jake, but he didn't mean to. It was out of, you know, an emotional outburst. And this is where the police get suspicious. They're like, it's well calculated. Like the answer to the questions are almost textbooked. The definition of his emotional disturbance is textbook. They start to question him, but Stabler's like, I don't know what I would do if that happened to my kid. We can't just say that this doctor killed him to kill him. It could have been an emotional outburst because anyone's capable of that, which again, isn't really justifiable at the end of the day. They have Morton in court, the defense attorney, and the other the defense attorney and the rest are pretty much vouching their cases why Morton is guilty and innocent when they get a new piece of evidence that they bring in from an old article that Dr. Morton wrote addressed and stated that he does believe that sociopaths cannot be treated and they will kill again and that they should do any means possible to stop these sociopaths and they take that as well to do anything possible is to kill them and this is where he says Yes, I'm a psychiatrist. I did write that 15 years ago, but you have to understand today I'm not speaking as a psychiatrist. I'm speaking as a grieving father, and that kind of persuades things. The defense attorney pretty much advocates that what would you do in that situation if your kid was killed? How would you react? And then the, and then the reverse is, well, just because something bad happens, you don't take revenge into your own hands, and you don't kill someone for killing your kid. And again, it's one of those debatable questions where it's how do you feel? I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't know what I would do in that situation, but sometimes is it right to kill someone based off what they did or do they suffer in prison? But the thing is, Jake was only going to go to prison until he was 18. So did he do the right thing? Because Jake would have got out and obviously been cold hearted and callous. Like I said, uh, one of the one of the doctors says you can't grow a conscious and obviously Jake is tormented and he might not be treated, but he could be treated. It's almost like they're acknowledging that it's okay to lose control in certain situations, which is another moral, moral issue where it's like, is it though? Like, I understand if your kid's killed, how would you react? I'm not judging anyone's opinion on that, but it is one of those situations where you gotta really take it all into consideration. And after the verdict, they end up finding Dr. Morton not guilty and he is relieved and the episode ends where he is doing a press conference and, and he leaves the court and he talks to Stabler and the, and the other lawyer. And we find out that Dr. Morton was in fact manipulating them all along. They said, when did you plan on killing Jake? And he looks them right in the face and he says, in the courtroom. And he gets away with it and the episode ends. This episode is so well written and detailed. It deals with child predators, child murderers, child victims, psychiatrists acting like they're grieving, sociopaths acting like they're upset. And it's just a well-rounded episode and I highly suggest it. I want to do more episodes like this if you liked it. All right, guys, that was the episode. Subscribe, hit that little dingling button harassing you, telling you, hey, it's me. I'm here. And I'm going to say it one time for the one time and two time for the O's. Give me a hell yeah for horror. It was a great episode.